Uh, good afternoon. We're going to get started here. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'm John Fenn, the head of research and programs at the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of all the staff to the latest presentation in our ongoing Benjamin A. Bakken lecture series. The Bakken series allows us to highlight the work of leading scholars in the discipline of folklore, ethnomusicology, oral history, and cultural heritage while enhancing our collections. For the center and the library, the Bakken lectures form an important facet of acquisition activities. Each lecture is video recorded and becomes part of our permanent collection. In addition, the lectures are later posted as webcasts on the library's website, where they are available for viewing to internet patrons throughout the world. Um, so now would be an excellent time to turn off your electronic devices and or put them in airplane mode, lest you become part of the recording. Today I have the honor of introducing the distinguished folklorist, Barry Jean Ancelet, a professor emeritus at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Over the years, we have presented many eminent colleagues, but few of them have made as significant an impact on the documentation, public awareness, and revitalization of their chosen areas of interest as has Professor Ancelé. Even fewer of them have been officially knighted by the government of France for their efforts. <laughs> Dr. Ancelé was born in Church Point, Louisiana, and grew up in the epicenter <laughs> of Cajun and Creole culture. He studied French as an undergraduate at what was then the University of Southwestern Louisiana, later to be renamed the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and received a master's in folklore from Indiana University. At IU, he taught for a few years before moving on to a doctorate in Etude Creole, Anthropology and Lingu Linguistics from the Université de Provence in Marseille in 1984. Professor Ancelet's lifelong commitment to Louisiana culture has served as a touchstone for his many landmark contributions as a scholar and a cultural activist, both inside and outside the academy. He co-founded the Tribute to Cajun Music in 1974, which developed into the annual Festival Acadien, and for more than a decade hosted Rendezvous de Cajun, an influential weekly music radio program on KRVS. He has authored an impressive number of books and articles, has been involved in a number of recordings and documentary films, and as an educator has trained and guided a generation of scholars specializing in Cajun Creole and Franco-American culture. Ancelet has served as chair of Univers University of Louisiana Modern Languages Department, as well as the founding director of its renowned Center for Acadian and Creole Folklore. His many other awards and honors include being named the Willis Granger and Tom DeBellion Professor of Francophone Studies in 2005 and being made a Chevalier and Lord de des Arts et des Lettres de la Republi République Française in 2006 by the Governor of France for important contributions to French art and literature. In 2008, he was awarded the prestigious Américo Paredes Prize by the American Folklore Society, and in 2009, he was named Louisiana Humanist of the Year by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. I would go on, but I think I've given you a sense of why we are so delighted to have Dr. Ancelet here today with us. Please join me in welcoming him for his talk on the theory and practice of folklore in Cajun and Creole, Louisiana. Thank you. Uh, kind of made me tired hearing all that. <clears throat> um, the, the first part of this talk deals with how I got into the study and practice of folklore. Uh, the second deals with what I learned and tried to do after that happened. I will ramble. The story is pretty wild and woolly, but I had a blast and got paid to do much of it. I grew up in, Cajun, in a Cajun French speaking family in South Louisiana. Uh, as a child, I spent a lot of time with the family of my father's sister in Vatican, Louisiana. They took care of me while my parents worked. Only one person in the house spoke a little English. So I grew up speaking French. When I was in the eighth grade, I found myself in uh, an academic French class for the first time. <clears throat> in it, French was taught as though it were a foreign language. In the summer of 1967, I spent six weeks in a study program in Swi Switzerland and France. When I returned, I called my aunt in Vatican to tell her about my trip. I was talking a mile a minute about ce que je sais maintenant et que je suis allé à Paris, using the grammar and vocabulary I had learned abroad. My aunt interrupted me saying, Beb, Beb, on dirait je te comprends plus, in perfect Cajun French. <laughs> baby, baby, it seems like I can't understand a word you're saying. I immediately understood that I was imitating an imported style of French. That was my first epiphany concerning the value of the vernacular. Fast forward to 1974, <clears throat> I was in Mamou, Louisiana, once again trying to track down Hugh Breed, 
who you see here with the black eye, <clears throat> to try to get him to tell me some more, uh, more of the fascinating tall tales that would eventually make up a significant part of my dissertation and would be uh, the subject of several of the conference papers, articles, and books that would eventually contribute to my tenure and promotions. I asked a, a waitress in the Traveler's Cafe if she knew where I might find him. She shot back with a curious grin, you're looking for him? When I see him coming, I hide in the kitchen. I, I don't want to hear all that nonsense. Not long after, I found myself in a graduate French course at Indiana University on the literature of Le Siècle des Lumières. We were considering Cyrano de Bergerac's Voyage à la Lune from the end of the 17th century, in which <clears throat> his character tries to get to the moon by filling hundreds of bottles with dew and rising with them in the morning. The little people he dreams of meeting eventually make comments about life in his country of origin and their, from their unique perspective. I raised my hand and pointed out that I had collected remarkably similar oral stories from Hugh Breed and his brothers Irving and Reven, <clears throat> in, uh, in one of which Jim Israel goes to the moon in a runaway hay baler by accident and meets little green men there who comment on life in the storyteller's native Mamu. I was fascinated by the apparent resilience of this tradition and narrative strategy among people who, after, who were, after all, the descendants of the French settlers who left France in the same 17th century to come to America, uh, uh, North America, and eventually to Louisiana. My professor did not understand why I would bring up such an unrelated issue in her class on French literature. I realized I might be in the wrong place. By then, my highly improvised early research on Cajun and Creole music, folk tales, and language had made me understand <clears throat> that my study of French was driven by my interest in understanding the Frenchness of Louisiana. I decided that I would drop the class, do my best to finish out the semester, and to go back home to rethink my plans. But I had a card in my pocket from Ralph Rensler, the director of the Smithsonian Institution's Folk Life Program, who had assisted us in preparing and presenting the first tribute to Cajun music uh, concert in March of 1974. There he is between two ballad singers. <clears throat> when I had mentioned to him that I was going to Indiana University, he gave me his card with a message on it and said that I should say hello to his friend, Henry Glassy, at IU's Folklore Institute. Out of a sense of obligation, after that incident in the French class, I dropped into the institute and asked the receptionist, into Carpenter, uh, if there was someone named Henry Glassy there. I didn't know that Professor Glassy was an internationally renowned folklorist. It, was, it would have been kind of like you know, going to the Collège de France and saying, is there some guy named Claude Levy Strauss here? <laughs> she gasped, pointed behind her to his office and said, uh, yeah, he's in there. I heard Glassy chuckle and say, who is that? I said, I'm Barry Onsley from Louisiana. He said, come on in. I introduced myself, handing him Rinsler's card, and he said, oh, you're from Louisiana. Do you know Dewey Balfa? I nearly screamed, yes, I did. And then I told him what had just happened in my French class. He said, well, maybe this is where you need to be. I transferred to the folklore program was able to preserve my ties with the French program through other professors there, including linguist Albert Wallman and Africanist Emile Snyder, who understood and encouraged my particular interests. Why folklore? I didn't even know there was such an academic discipline until I arrived at Indiana University in 1974. Soon enough, I found myself taking classes from Richard Dorson, Linda Daig, Mary Ellen Brown, Bruce Rosen, a, a literal who's who in American folklore. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't know who any of them were. I found out. But I already come to understand uh, through my experiences in Louisiana that the, that the language was inseparable from the culture that expressed. Another thing that was obvious was that very little of this could be found on, on uh, library shelves. Ultimately, getting at Louisiana's French heritage and culture would require, oops, would require <clears throat> um, uh, an improvised hybrid approach involving real people in real time. That approach turned out to be folklore. And I must say also that uh, 
some of this had to do with the counterculture movement. This was, after all, you know, the late 60s, early 70s. And, uh, you know, we were interested in uh, protesting. We're good. We were interested in protesting, and for us, uh, the counterculture was protesting against Americanization, and it involved uh, revitalization of Louisiana French language and, and culture. <clears throat> no accident that the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana was founded in 1968. 1968, when so many other things happened. The study of culture, literature, and language through the lens of folklore has been the foundation for my entire career, which I admit I have improvised all along the way. Oops. I left Indiana, Indiana University with a master's uh, degree in folklore and eventually continued my graduate studies at Aix-en-Provence, where I received a doctorate in, Cre in Creole studies combining anthropology and linguistics, working with Robert Chonasson and Jean-Claude Bouvier, who were reinventing and reinvigorating the study of orality in France. My thesis included that story about the accidental voyage to the moon, among many others that I collected in, throughout South Louisiana. I guess that it was fitting because my theoretical approach to just about everything I have ever studied has been based on the rich and fecund principles of storytelling, including improvisation, vernacular creation, and carnivalesque humor. I also dedicated my first ever article, published as a folklorist, to the waitress in the Traveler's Cafe, <laughs> who never understood what a supposedly serious college student was doing looking for somebody she tried to get away from every day. <laughs> I've often found myself exploring issues whose academic value has not been immediately evident. My, much of my research was based on field work in bars and barbershops and dance halls and back porches and Mardi Gras runs. Can you find me? Oh. Am I there? I will appear to you. There I am. <laughs> From that perspective, you really understand the Mardi Gras. Oh, I'll leave that to you to find. <laughs> it's Mardi Gras, after all. <clears throat> As per the old saw, it has not always been easy, but somebody had to do it. My research has resulted in the usual articles and books, but also in documentary films, television and radio programs, festivals, museum and photographic exhibitions, album liner notes, public lectures, literary readings, teacher training seminars, reports to state and federal agencies. I'm grateful and fortunate that my colleagues and administrators at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette have been flexible enough to recognize the value of what I do. I've had a remarkably collaborative career uh, <clears throat> I've had the honor and good fortune to work with generous, inspiring colleagues, including editors, filmmakers, sound engineers, production crews, fellow teachers, folklorists, historians, linguists, poets, playwrights, screenplay writers, photographers, journalists, a few politicians, lawyers, and even a chef. They've all provided me with the countless opportunities for <clears throat> collaboration and years of inspiration and dedication to our common causes. They all taught me how to read and write and look and listen and wonder. I owe a, de a debt of gratitude as well to the singers and storytellers and Mardi Gras runners and dancers, including my family and community of friends who have always so generously shared what they know and do with me, most of them en français. Learn what much of what I have come to know from vernacular professors such as Dewey Balfa and Ben Guinain, Clifton Chenier, and Canary Fontenot, Felix Richard, Evelia Boudreau, Huben Irving Reed, among many others. <clears throat> I've been honored to work with them and learn from them, and I've come to love them all as friends. I've had the honor of eulogizing many of them when they passed away. It was never only the songs and the stories and the crafts. It was the coffee and camaraderie, the bull sessions and the jam sessions and the fishing trips and the serious and casual conversations about almost everything and nothing in particular. The rest of this talk focuses on the relationship between theory and the practice of folklore, between what folklorists think and how they convey the results of that thought to a range of audiences, from other colleagues to the general public. 
First, a word about theory and practice. <clears throat> Some folklorists have seen a, a dichotomy between the two. I have always seen them as inextricably integrated. I'm typically more interested in discussing the practice than the theory, but both are always in play. I came to understand for myself what Regina Bendix eventually theorized in her In Search of Authenticity in countless conversations with musicians and storytellers and the makers of things about the authentique and the photantique, as well as <clears throat> what Elaine Lawless eventually called reciprocal fieldwork by negotiating meaningful and productive relationships with countless uh, generous collaborators whom I learned early on were much more than just informants. In my transcriptions of uh, the recorded interviews I made with them, I still cannot bring myself to identify them as L1 and L0, as linguistic practice recommends. The most, for example, the most I will reduce Evelia Boudreau with whom I shared storytelling sessions and watched shoot squirrels out of her back door, <laughs> is E.B. I came to understand what an implement, <clears throat> uh, there she is shooting squirrels on the back door. <laughs> <clears throat> I came to understand and implement issues that scholars such as Walter Ong, Paul Zumthor, Pierre Bourdieu, and Bruce Jackson articulated concerning orality and the challenge of interpreting and representing stories in written form by trudging through an, an evolution of strategies to resolve these issues for my, own, uh, for my use in my own work. I came to improvise takeoffs on what Clifford Geertz called deep play and what Ma Mikhail Bakhtin and Victor Turner called uh, carnivalesque laughter while lying face down in the middle of the Grand Marais Mardi Gras circle dressed as a pregnant woman waiting to be ritually flogged and then giving birth <clears throat> to a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <coughs> From that perspective, you learn a lot, you understand a lot about Mardi Gras. I came to understand the importance of performance and contextual considerations described by scholars such as Roger Abrams, Kenny Goldstein, and Nick Spitzer by thinking through the very real and evolving performance and contextual issues <clears throat> uh, involved in documenting and presenting folk performers and putting those into practice in festivals and concerts, museum exhibitions and documentary films and radio programs and community presentations. <clears throat> <clears throat> in what I have come to call uh, guerrilla academics, sneaking education to people while they think they're being entertained. For me, theories are not ends in themselves. They are instead the tools and blueprints I need to understand and present what I am studying by any means necessary to borrow from Jean-Paul Sartre and Malcolm X. I have imported some, improvised variants of others, and then I used them. For me, the pursuit of the universal always began with the local. The universe, after all, is made up of an infinity of localities. The practice of folklore generally starts with fieldwork, the process of gathering information from cultural sources. For me, it was the only way to reach the information <clears throat> that was otherwise missing uh, from the record. The most important untapped source for the information on Cajuns and Creoles are Cajuns and Creoles themselves. The fieldwork-based uh, approach of folkloristics provides a method to reach that source. The naturally interdisciplinary nature of folkloristics, necessarily integrating considerations of history and art, and text and context, provides <coughs> um, the wide range of approaches ne necessary to understand the complexities of culture and tradition, including oral tradition, traditional music, vernacular architecture, folk art, seasonal rituals, and other cultural expressions. Folkloristics also leads to, the, to considerations of important cultural and social issues such as conservation, transmission, and innovation within the context of tradition. And folkloristics and ling linguistics make perfect partners in the effort to understand the context of French Louisiana. Now, <clears throat> getting back to er earlier, the reason I knew Dewey Balfa when Henry Glassie asked is another part of the story. In 1972, I spent an academic year in France, 72, 73. Homesick after nearly a year away from my native South Louisiana, I was drawn to an announcement of Roger Mason performing La Musique Cajun de la Louisiane. 
there's the counterculture uh, connection. <coughs> There, among many other songs, I heard him playing what I recognized to be a simplified version of the Crowley two-step. I heard that when I was buying my ticket. And when I heard that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. That's what I'm missing. That's what's been missing here. And so I rushed down and had a wonderful evening with him. After the concert, I met with Mason, an American folk musician who had encountered KG music on the folk festival circuit and who was then performing it in France. I told him how much I appreciated hearing, he was a, a, an army brat who traveled all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I told him how much I had appreciated hearing the music from home. Growing up in the late 1950s and 60s, I listened to rock and roll like the rest of my generation, but we heard Cajun music on the radio, <coughs> uh, on television, and when it was daddy's turn to choose the records. Mason said, if you're from Louisiana, you must know the people I learned from, Dewey Balfa, Nathan Apshar. I didn't know any of them at that point. They had not come up in any of my classes back home. Mason suggested if I was interested in learning more, I should look up Dewey Balfa upon my return to Louisiana. That's exactly what I did. I went to Dewey Balfa's house just south of Basile and introduced myself, <clears throat> telling him about the experiences I had in France. I said, are you Dewey Balfa? Yeah. Well, my name is Barry Osley, and I'm at Dewey I was talking like an auctioneer. He said, calm down, son. Come on in. Said the spider to the fly. And the rest, as they say, is history. <clears throat> we started a conversation that went on. Uh, oops, sorry, that's him. Uh, we started a conversation that went on for nearly two decades. I learned at least as much from Dewey as from any professor I ever had in any formal academic setting. People are most aware of my work in Cajun and Creole music, perhaps because of the high vis visibility of Festivals Acadiana Creole, which I helped found and still direct and the weekly uh, Liberty Theater live radio show, which I did for 24 years. But what first drew me to the study of Cajun and Creole folk cultures <coughs> uh, was oral tradition. My first book, Cajun and Creole uh, Music Makers, grew out of my work with musicians, but it was based more on their stories than their music. Elmore Morgan Jr. and I got the idea to visit the musicians involved in the first festival, uh, to visit them where they lived, worked and played, to interview them about their lives and experiences and to photograph them in their own worlds. <clears throat> uh, this is Varys Connor, uh, a well-known, uh, or not so well-known uh, fiddler, Nathan Abshire on his front porch. <clears throat> um, what we were doing was indeed field work, but it felt more like visiting. It was our intention to see and hear in their own terms, as I wrote in the introduction, these barbers and bus drivers and farmers and firefighters and mechanics and masons who sell discount furniture and discount gas and insurance and insulation and work nine to five and seven to seven onshore and offshore and make art out of everyday life because they were becoming important figures in this cultural self-preservation experiment. Elmore and I worked for 10 years on the project, collecting oral histories and taking photographs of these remarkable performers in various contexts, from their kitchens and front porches to festival stages and concert halls in Louisiana and far beyond. Around the same time, <clears throat> I became interested in Louisiana, uh, Louisiana French fictional tales. French-speaking Cajuns and Creoles had virtually no literary tradition since most of, did not have the opportunity to learn to read or write French. Yet we did have a tradition of oral poetry in songs and oral stories in tales. And just because the storytellers and singers could not themselves write their own stories and songs, this did not mean that the stories and songs could not be written by someone who had learned to write the language of their expression. In an attempt to place these traditions and the imaginaire that they represent, <coughs> uh, on the record, I began recording folk tales as well as folk songs and trans transcribing them. Lacking any formal training in uh, the beginning, uh, I improvised my own first fieldwork forays 
based on instinct and good intentions. You know, that road to hell. <clears throat> I found that identifying potential singers was fairly easy. Friends and family members were generally, generally aware of those in their midst who can sing. Identifying storytellers proved to be more of a challenge. Everybody tells stories, but who knows who does? At least initially, uh, when, like some of my predecessors, uh, Alcee Fortier, Elizabeth Brandon, Corinne Sociab, I was using fieldwork techniques designed to elicit the kind of animal tales and magic tales that clearly illustrate the connection between French Louisiana and its historical and cultural roots in France and Africa. I was confounded by this curious difficulty in finding those kinds of stories. Found some, but it was hard. And it began to occur to me that something must be wrong. Corinne Saussier had written in the introduction to her collection of 33 Louisiana French folk tales that her collection of 33 stories was small but representative of a culture that was fast disappearing in our mechanized age. And I thought, there's something wrong with this. Because my admittedly activist perspective made me unwilling to admit that the tra tradition was dying. And second, I knew that there were stories out there because of the thousands I had heard over the years in my father's barbershop where I had spent many afternoons after school and around barbecue pits and in shipping boat, in fishing boats and in lots of other places, in bars. So I rethought my fieldwork strategy and I realized that it was more effective to look for storytellers than stories. <clears throat> uh, that information about carnivalesque humor was more likely to come from folks in a bar or a barbershop or a garage than from those running city hall or local museums or churches. An essential aspect of my change in method methodology involved being open to any context and form of storytelling. I found people remembered from long ago, uh, I found that my, my early method had exposed the tradition of memory, stories that some re people remembered from long ago but no longer really actively told while my new approach exposed a more active tradition, jokes and tall tales and person, personal experience narratives that people were telling each other on their own, unprompted by a folklorist question. I basically learned to shut up and listen. It became, uh, quickly, uh, quickly became clear that stories were not ends in themselves. The storytellers themselves were the real treasures. My aim was to consider their ability to adapt, innovate, create new forms of stories through their talent and personality. Their willingness to share their knowledge was essential to, my, to the progress of my research. The first time I met Mrs. Evelia Boudreau, <coughs> for example, she told me four stories. That's the lady shooting the gun out the back. She told me four stories, including an animal tale featuring Bouquet à la Paix, a version of Petit Pousset, the first from African origins, the second from French origins, responding to my re request for such tales. By the time I visited her one year later, I had had my epiphany and opened my consideration of tales to include anything she wanted to tell. She told me seven more stories, some of them jokes, personal experience stories. When I re returned home that night, I found a message uh, that Mrs. Boudreaux had called saying she, wanted, she had some more stories she wanted to tell me. I said, I know, I went earlier th uh, to the, today to record her. My mother said, no, no. She just called and said she wants you to go back tomorrow because she said some more she forgot to tell you today. <laughs> I returned the next day and she told me eight more stories. Over the years, she dredged up dozens and dozens and dozens of stories from her memory to tell me, many of them while waiting for the bass to bite in her pond. <laughs> Similarly, <clears throat> I first met Ben Guinea while tracking down leads on storytellers the old way in Parks, Parks, Louisiana, a place called Promised Land. A little boy who had won the foot race to my truck when I asked a group of uh, children for help in finding where people on my list lived uh, eventually took me to his grandfather's house. He went with us to the last house and heard what we were asking for. And when we left, disappointed because the lady didn't tell those kinds of stories, he said, well, my grandfather tells those stories. So we took to, went to his uh, grandfather's house, and there I met Ben Guinea, 
who quite literally left a plate of steaming crawfish stew on his kitchen table to come into the living room to tell his tales, literally preferring to tell stories than eat. Over the years, he too told me dozens of stories of all sorts. His remarkable storytelling talents and wide repertoire of stories were eventually attracted considerable attention, including a filming session by Louisiana Public Broadcasting on the porch of his little house in Promised Land along Bayou Teche. To the astonishment and eventual delight of his neighbors, who had stopped listening to his stories years before. But now LPB was there. And a few weeks later, he appears on television. And so Ben gets reconsidered in his own community. Based on a philosophy of cultural activism again, I tried to find ways to integrate uh, people like this into the ongoing effort to preserve Louisiana's French language and culture. Mrs. Boudreau, Ben Guinet, and several other storytellers appeared in storytelling events at festivals and schools, thrilling crowds and stu school children with their impressive repertoires and masterful styles. Sometimes in addition to, sometimes instead of documenting and analyzing past performances within the scholarly community, some folklorists strive to program and present one of those next performances in a setting that will communicate it to a wider audience, not on the page, but on a stage. This practice brings challenges of its own. For example, the most sensitively programmed cultural presentation at a folk festival is not the same as the natural performance in its own time and place. But some of these concerns can be resolved or at least mitigated with the same sort of careful and serious study of performance and context as that uh, produced in the academic setting. Programming issues <clears throat> were directly related to the activist fieldwork and archival philosophies at the heart of the L University of Louisiana Center for Acadian Creole Folklore, now part of the Center for Louisiana Studies. The theoretical uh, issues underpinning the fieldwork that initially led to the production of the first Tribute to Cajun Music Festival, uh, March 26, 1974, as well as the issues that emerged and evolved as the concert became an annual event, uh, were directly related to the establishment of the center's archives. The programming of the festival was based on an integration of ideas that grew out of two distinct camps. On the one hand, activist folk, folk life based considerations as influenced by the Smithsonian Institution's Festival of American Folk Life, and on the other, linguistic based considerations that grew out of the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana's uh, language and cultural preservation initiatives. Field work and programming uh, practices evolved based on a desire to discover and present excellent folk performers from real life contexts, avoiding more self-conscious public purveyors of folklorico culture. The field work practices that grew out of the festival experience also contributed to the field work uh, <coughs> practices that addressed the collection and analysis of other traditional genres in French Louisiana, including oral tradition and material culture. Selecting the collection of performers who would event essentially define the moment in Cajun music and Zydeco each year posed an in interesting problems and opportunities for festival producers, including the incorporation of young performers and the new emerging styles that are necessar necessarily part of any living tradition. Dewey Balfa put it best. He said, I'm interested in the very life of this culture uh, and how it continues to evolve in its own terms. I don't want to freeze dry it or pin it to the wall like a dead butterfly. Dewey was not only a musician, but what folklorists have come to call a community scholar, that is, a member of a folk community who has learned to address the issues that are at the heart and, uh, of the study and practice of folklore, such as cultural equity and the relationship between preservation and innovation within the traditional context. Inspired by Dewey and enriched by his connections to the Smithsonian uh, fest f folk life program staff, in es including especially Ralph Rensler, who had uh, first recorded him in 1964 uh, as a field worker for the Newport Folk Festival, uh, we prepared the first tribute to Cajun Music Festival together. 
The field work we did for the festival was a natural extension of the field work that had begun with John and Alan Lomax, who collected folk songs in Louisiana for the Library of Congress in, 19, in the 1930s. The Lomaxes had a sort of New Deal style activist agenda <clears throat> intending for their collection to serve as the basis for cultural recycling projects in regions throughout the country. Based on his experience in French Louisiana in 1934 and from his position on the Newport Folk Festival Board in 1964, Allen sent Ralph Rensler and Mike Seeger to Louisiana to identify musicians who would be invited to perform at Newport later that year. Following leads from Harry Oster, <clears throat> who had collected in the area a few years before, they found Gladys Thibodeau, Louis Vines Lejeune, and Dewey Balfa, who served as a last minute replacement on guitar, by the way. Dewey noted that they initially thought the crowd hated their music because they weren't dancing. Then at the end of that first song, the crowd applauded. It was an experience the dance hall musicians had never had, but also one they never forgot. Dewey reported turning to Vines and saying, what are they doing? <laughs> <coughs> he was overwhelmed by this reception for what was often dismissed as nothing but chanky chank back home, came back uh, home to Louisiana determined to spread the good news that Cajun music was appreciated outside the area. He maintained close con contact with Rensler who became director of folk life programs at the Smithsonian in 67. There Rensler went on to produce the annual festival of American folk life celebrating the country's rich diver uh, cultural diversity. These festivals often featured Cajun and Creole music that Rensler had encountered during his early field work. Through his steady contact <coughs> with Rensler and other folklorists, Balfa learned to articulate such issues as cultural conservation and the process of tradition. The first Cajun Music Festival was an overwhelming success, surprising even the most enthusiastic, enthusiastic of his organizers. <laughs> Musicians were selected according to, the not to notions of cultural authenticity established by Rensler and Balfa. No crooners, Rensler cautioned, his preference for the high, clear, uh, high-pitched vocals and unadorned instrumental styles of early Cajun music dominated the evening. The concert was structured to feature the historical development of Cajun and Creole music, ballad singers Inez Catalan and Marcus Landry, twin fiddlers Dennis McGee and Sadie Courville, early stylists <coughs> Mark Savoy, Lionel Lalu and Viris Connor, Nathan Apshire, the Balfa brothers, <coughs> the Ardwan family, as well as more modern sounds of Clifton Chenier, Baki Forest Jay, and the Cajun Aces. Cajun country star, Jimmy Newman, originally from Mamou, but then living in Nashville, whose hit, Lash Pala Patat, was in full swing, was used to anchor the concert, despite his sophisticated um, instrumental arrangements and silky vocals. Even, even Rinsler saw the wisdom of Dewey's brilliant plan to use Newman's popularity to attract a crowd that would then be there to hear the rest of the evening. It worked. The many in attendance commented then and later that they had come to hear Newman and were in some cases reminded of and in others surprised by the power of the more traditional performers. The festival packed Lafayette's Blackham Coliseum far past fire code despite lightning, thunder, and driving rain. It turned out to be the largest mass rally of what came to be called the Louisiana French Renaissance Movement. I knew the fire, you can see the crowd there. I knew the fire marshal wouldn't shut us down because his dad was playing in the third group. <coughs> <laughs> Southern politics. Organizers also saw the opportunity to use the energy produced by this initial concert to fuel a long-term project. In the momentum of the moment, the university created the Center for Acadian and Creole Folklore to integrate this new field of study into the academic community. Balfa, who had seen the benefit of the archives at the Library of Congress and at the Smithsonian Institution, insisted that we needed a similar bank of information on ourselves in Louisiana. When I pointed out that I didn't have the financial resources to produce an archive, Balfa pointedly asked, do you have enough money to buy one tape? I said, yeah. He continued, then buy one, go out and record an interview and put that tape on the shelf. Then record another one when you can afford it. And when you put that second tape next to the first one on the shelf, you have the beginnings of an archive. <laughs> he was right, as usual. 
The beginnings of the archive were just that homemade, and it worked. But at the same time, Council for the Development of French in Louisiana bought dozens of tapes and funded early uh, recording efforts using fieldwork tapes in French radio programming. Soon enough, we also received financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation that paid for hundreds of tapes, which were recorded and gathered on the shelves to extend the archive. <coughs> We also contacted folklorists who had worked in Louisiana in the past, such as Lomax, Oster, and Rinsler, who were all happy to provide copies of their fieldwork uh, collections. So, gathered, and finally, gathered in one place for the first time, the center's archives provided a sense of the evolution and development of Cajun and Creole music from unaccompanied ballad tradition to contemporary dance band styles. Field work on oral tradition and material culture was added as well. The field uh, <coughs> work of students and, and colleagues uh, ev enriched our understanding of who we were and how we had come to be that way. But the collection was not meant to be an end in itself. Instead, it was always intended to serve as a resource, a resource for cultural recycling. For example, when the center acqu acquired copies of the Lomax's 1934 field recordings, it was not only to repatriate this important research for archival purposes. Copies were pro also provided to the families of the original performers, and contemporary musicians were in encouraged to uh, use the collection as a source for new, brand new, old songs. This eventually happened. <coughs> Oops. Where is my cursor? Well, I was going to let you hear it. You can see it on the screen? Ah, okay. This is Elita Hofpower from the Lomax recordings from 34. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. And this is from 2007. Isn't that remarkable? As Anna Cheritakis, Alan's daughter, said when I played some of this for her, my God, it worked. <laughs> In the spirit of cultural recycling, sc scholars and staffers um, associated with the Center for Acadian Creole Folklore have participated in the production of festivals and special performances, television and radio programs, and offered classes and workshops through the university's French and Francophone Studies and Music School programs produce books and articles, communicate new discoveries and interpretations to the local community as well as the scholarly community. There were precious few books and articles available on Cajun and Creole culture, and most of the few that there were had been done by outsiders who often misunderstood the culture. I became in interested in writing so that there would be some. But books and articles do not reach the, larger the large audience of Cajun and Creoles themselves, who especially needed to have access to information about themselves. So, Center Associates have, uh, explored other ways to disseminate uh, our findings. We joined forces with record producers to re release archival recordings. We worked with radio producers and filmmakers to produce special programs and documentaries. Collaborated with ed educational institutions to make singers and storytellers available for classes <coughs> and special lecture series. This research typically focuses on contemporary as well as historical aspects of these issues, considering folklore as a vital ongoing process rather than a stagnant product. Of particular interest is the process of creolization, the unique blending of cultures that occurred in Louisiana to produce the folk uh, architecture, music, oral tradition, and cuisine of the region. <clears throat> Through this range of activities, we try to integrate both sides of folkloristics, the scholarly and the public, without getting caught in the perceived trap between the two. <clears throat> Folk festivals have often tied, uh, tend to follow a high-energy uh, model 
oriented toward large audiences developed decades ago at such events as the National Folk Festival and the Newport Folk Festival. This method of presentation has had positive effects, not the least of which has been providing the national level validation for regional folk performers by having them perform on stages high off the ground with fancy electronic ap amplification before large, and large enthusiastic audiences, often alongside nationally known performers. <clears throat> this method also has certain limitations. A quieter, more intimate performance genres are difficult to program in such high energy settings. In most cultures, ballad singing is intended for listeners, that is, without dancing. It does not usually happen before thousands or even hundreds of people. In a large festival setting, both audience and performer must be prepared for this change in format. Smaller, more intimate, so-called workshops can provide more familiar intimate setting, but even these may not be enough to set a cultural event in its uh, best cult performance context. By carefully dr uh, drawing on careful observation of the rules and nature of cultural performance in a natural setting, folklorists can develop better, more sensitive, and more effective and less abusive methods of presenting folklore and folk life in public settings. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> Storytelling, for example, has been one of the most difficult cultural features to program effectively in a festival setting. Usually, <clears throat> storytellers are tacitly expected to perform as stand-up comics, though many do not possess the skills for entertaining the masses, nor are they necessarily inter in interested in developing those skills. But settings can be renegotiated to work better for performer and audience as well. Storytelling is generally by nature an intimate performance that occurs among a small group of people who know each other and share a common language and references. Some storytellers can go a long way toward reaching a festival or a concert-sized audience, which may number in the hundreds or thousands, but a crowd that large will strain even the most outstanding traditional performer. <clears throat> During a performance of what used to be uh, our university's French house, Creole storyteller Ben Guinet that I met that night uh, over crawfish etouffee, uh, renegotiated his audience in a remarkable way. A crowd of some 70 people showed up to hear his extraordinary, uh, this extraordinary storyteller perform. He was pleased with the show of interest, but as he began, I noticed that was, something was off. He was telling well, but he wasn't taking off, as I had heard him do so often while listening to his stories in his living room or on his front porch. I realized later that he was straining to engage every person in the room. He realized this before I did. I was sitting next to him about a third of the way through the first story. He accidentally bumped my knee during one of his uh, expansive gestures. He was trying to hug everybody. <clears throat> when he noticed I was within reach, he turned his chair to face me and proceeded to tell me the stories. I was an audience he could handle tapping, and pushing, and pinching me to make appropriate points. I was also an audience he trusted because I understood the stories. He knew that. He hit stride, and the rest of the evening, the crowd watched him tell me stories, which was much better than for everyone concerned. When I realized what had happened, I began ex experimenting with new formats for programming storytelling based on the concept that Ben had instinctively put into practice. This programming st strategy, a sort of theater in the round where storytellers tell each other stories while the audience listens in, became the basis for the Louisiana Storytellers Pavilion that travel traveled to festivals throughout the state in 1984. Uh, by 1974, when Dewey Balfour talked the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana into sponsoring the first tribute to Cajun Music concert, he had already come to understand enough about the dynamics of context and performance from his own experiences to know that a Cajun crowd would dance if it were at all possible, <laughs> as they did every Saturday night in dance halls throughout South Louisiana. The intent of the concert we were producing was to enable Cajuns to appreciate the value of their own music by getting them to listen to it. So he strongly suggested holding the concert in a setting where dancing would not be possible. That evening, 12,000 Cajuns wiggled in their seats <laughs> in Lafayette's Blackham Coliseum and listened to the sounds that they had only heard before while dancing. <clears throat> um, sometimes 
Festival organizers develop new ways of presenting culture based on, the, uh, on our, our observations of performance in its own context. Sometimes participants can, do, uh, can and do take over with their own theories about context and performance. Over the years, Dewey Boffa was visited by many folklorists and invited to many festivals. He learned from them what he needed to know to guide his own efforts to regenerate interest and respect for Cajun music in his native South Louisiana. This information also turned Boffa into quite an expert on folk festival theory sometimes to the chagrin of festival organizers who have not always thought out in, uh, issues as well as he had and certainly did not feel them as he did. There are many examples that illustrate Dewey's understanding of culture as process rather than product. For years, he tried to convince festival organizers to allow him to come with his current band as he performed in dance halls every Saturday night. He eventually won a partial victory coming with most of his dance band, but he was never allowed to bring along his steel guitar to the Smithsonian Festival of American Folklife. The argument was that the steel guitar was too modern, an inappropriate and inauthentic addition to traditional instrumentation. That's tradition from their perspective. <clears throat> Never mind the fact that Dewey Boffa, long recognized as a pillar of cultural preservation in America, chose to perform weekly with a steel guitar in his band, just as other, dozens of other Cajun's band did. In 1978, he finally confronted festival personnel, Smithsonian festival personnel, on the issue, asking them pointedly, are you trying to present Cajun music as you wish it still were, or as it really is? and there was that exact same deafening silence <laughs> in the room. He was allowed that year to bring along fiddler Dick Richard, who also played a few tunes on the steel guitar. Small steps. In 1985, Dewey delivered a brilliant extemporaneous address on the traditional process from the stage of the cultural conservation area of the Washington Festival. Invited as an outstanding example of the effort to conserve America's traditional culture, he pointed out halfway through a 45-minute set that he had been playing some traditional songs, songs that he and his brothers had <coughs> um, uh, learned from the family tradition. He went on to say that he was now would like to play some songs that he and his brothers had comp composed recently. He went on to say that he didn't have to turn around to know that what he just said had made some people backstage very nervous because he was there to represent cultural conservation. But for him, cultural conservation did not mean preserving things. For him, cultural conservation meant preserving the life of the culture, the process. And if he was successful, then the culture was going to be alive and well and continue to grow and evolve in its own terms. And if this effort was successful in his native Louisiana, then 50 or so years from now, some young musicians were going to need some songs that were 50 or so years old to play. So he had made some, and he was going to play one. He did. He played Conjete Pauvre, and the stage personnel and the audience were delighted to hear that his new song sounded just like the old ones from his family tradition. He capped this remarkable demonstration by pointing out, he was not one to leave a point alone, <clears throat> explaining that they sounded like the old stuff because they were coming from the same tradition and through the same process and being performed by the same guy, so why wouldn't they sound familiar? But it was brand new. Festival organizers should never be afraid to be surprised. The people we invite to perform at festivals sometimes are un undereducated, but never, I've never found it many to be un unintelligent. In a sense, Dewey's presentation was much more successful, successful and authentic than the authentic-like one that was originally intended for the cultural conservation stage that day. The audience and festival personnel alike had the opportunity to learn a fancy lesson about culture. After years of performing in such contexts, Dewey learned well how to operate the machinery. In this case, he was aiming his message in two directions at once. The immediate message was aimed at the audience, but, the, that, but that message and its reception was obviously meant to rebound backstage. <coughs> uh, 
at the Liberty Theater, we did a lot of field work on the fly, sometimes discovering things that were happening right on stage. This is Mitch Reed playing with Goldman Thibodeau. He was there to play with another group and decided to play with Goldman, and so why wouldn't he? Sometimes the field work <clears throat> was very close to the presentation, as in the case of Horace Trahan's debut. Some of you may know Horace Trahan, young Cajun musician. Helena Putnam, our Liberty stage manager, reported hearing a remarkable young accordion player and singer at a jam session at the Jean Lafitte uh, Acadian Culture Center next door earlier that afternoon. During the Liberty show that night, she recognized the young man sitting in the audience and pointed him out to me. I had learned to trust her instincts. On a whim, and trusting her, I, uh, based on years of shared mutual observations from our backstage perspective, I went down into the audience while a song was on, was being played, and invite, asked him if he would be interested in performing a song or two. Yes, sir, he said. And he came up, and we crowbarred him into the proceedings that evening, the, the performance that evening, got him alone, sitting on a chair in the middle of the stage during a stolen moment between scheduled performances. The, scout, the crowd spontaneously gave him a standing ovation. Not bad for, him, for an improvised debut. He eventually returned to perform many times with his own band and others. <clears throat> Another example, uh, and the, the final one I'll give you, uh, is has to do uh, with uh, per negotiating performance and context on the fly. It comes from an idea I had when the Festival, Festival International des Arts Traditionnels de Québec was looking to include a Louisiana French component to their event in 1999. In an attempt to take into consideration issues that context-minded folklorists such as Frank Prochan and Charles Cant Cantwell have addressed, calling for more holistic community-based programming at folk festivals, I suggested they invite the Basile Mardi Gras as a group. Within this group, I suggested they would have cultural critical mass that would include culinary traditions, the communal gumbo, traditional music, the ritual song and the musics played for dancing at the host houses, and material culture, mask and costume making, as well as the performance of the ritual itself. <clears throat> Festival organizers were eventually convinced to try this integrated presentation rather than the more typical approach that would involve disparate bearers of various traditional arts. So the Basile group went to, went to Quebec where they demonstrated the various aspects of their Mardi Gras. Visitors could watch the mass being made, then try them on. They could watch the making of the gumbo, then taste it. They could listen to the music and dance to it. Then the Basile group was asked to put the whole affair together and demonstrate a run. The museum organizers said, well, what is this? how does this work? What does it look like? Which they were happy to do. <clears throat> they had demonstrated their tradition before at, Liberty, at the Liberty Theater. Uh, <clears throat> as well as a few outings in, at the Louisiana Folklife Festival in several cities within the state. But the only real way to demonstrate a Mardi Gras run is to run Mardi Gras. It's the only way that the carnivalesque dynamic can be conjured. So they cranked up a performance in the museum. Now, of course, Mardi Gras runs are not static. They move. The whole point is to visit and disturb or tickle what you determined to be your host community. So they headed out the back door after this performance. <clears throat> formed up in the park behind the museum and headed out into the streets. They didn't have a clear idea of where they were where where they were, but they instinctively improvised a route and headed down the sidewalk looking for the nearest bar doing their ceremonial begging routines for passers-by who had no clue what this was about. <clears throat> Luckily, most seemed to figure out fairly quickly that this must be some festive performance associated with the nearby museum. I was pressed into service to hastily explain to those they encountered what was going on. Some understood a bit and smiled. Most had little or no idea how to take the performance and shied away from the group. Uh, clutching purses, bags, and children. <laughs> the museum and festival workers didn't know this would happen either, but were reluctant to restrain what they had, uh, after all, asked the group to do. 
we were quite frankly all intrigued to watch this spontaneous carnivalesque improvisation. The group processed down the street with a small entourage of handlers trying to buffer the public as much as possible. They finally made it to a bar, which should be familiar territory, and went inside. <clears throat> they asked for permission to perform, gathered together, sang their song, danced to the music provided by their accompanying musicians, and then genuinely begged from donations from everybody inside, including drinks from the bartender. <clears throat> Alerting, alerted to the situation and made aware that this was a spillover from the nearby museum, everybody happily cooperated, and the group left happily. <clears throat> but Mardi Gras is also about challenging thresholds, so once back out on the street, they escalated the stakes. They gathered at a bus stop and waited for the next bus. <laughs> I was able to convince Captain Ryder that this might not be a good idea since neither of us knew Quebec City bus routes and how far the bus would take them. They toyed with the idea of boarding the bus anyway, mostly to make me nervous. Then they resumed their procession along the sidewalk after a brief standoff with the bus driver over who should be collecting money. <laughs> <clears throat> they hit the next bar they saw. The experience from the first bar was virtually repeated. When they left again, I was able to convince the captain that this was just a demonstration run after all, and that we could head back to the museum now. He agreed and led his contingent back, but not without interacting with everyone they passed along the way. <clears throat> uh, when they were safely back into the museum, uh, they sang their song again, danced a bit more, and then served and ate the gumbo with all who were there according to their tradition. To the relief of organizers, no one had been lost or hurt or too offended, but it was definitely more Mardi Gras than they had anticipated. <laughs> it was probably less than the participants would happily have done if given more rain. The group had extracted something like a Mardi Gras feeling out of this artificial experience by insisting on going out on their own terms and temporarily ignoring efforts to deter them. <clears throat> so where does this uh, leave us? All sorts of uh, highly technical studies have derived from uh, <clears throat> study, uh, academic study of folklore and uh, in my experience, I found that the possibilities of focusing especially on performance and contextual theory and folk arts programming in the public sector uh, didn't need to be uh, conflictual. There are cultural imperatives in each performance of traditional culture, including setting, t time, constant negotiation between performers and audience. The, consider the consideration of these complex uh, features have led to a lot of studies Many of these focus on the capturing of traditional performance for contemplation and analysis. Folklorists espousing contextual and performance-centered approaches have insisted on the importance of studying the very life and nature of the cultural performance in its most natural expression and setting. Well, that's what Dewey Boffa was hoping for. Their discoveries and subsequent theories can and do serve to adapt and, and improve public pr pres uh, presentation of folk arts, whether within a community-based cultural presentation, in a cultural presentation destined for visitors as well as members of the community, or in a multicultural presentation outside the community. Conversely, <coughs> folk public, folklore sec uh, public sector folklorists can and do extract and engage in performance theory by observing how performers adapt themselves to unfamiliar settings and unfamiliar settings to themselves. These strategies can be identified to help refine and improvise future presentations and settings. <coughs> and we've studied lots of things. I'm going to uh, hasten through the next uh, few moments. Uh, we've studied lots of things that such as the evolution of house types from what we found in France and Acadia, uh, the Canadian Maritimes, and how those got improvised in Louisiana. The addition of porches, which shows cultural confluence of uh, Acadian and African. Of and then what happens when uh, that house type is in everybody's head, and you build a modern house on a slab. And what happens when Katrina and Rita blow through 
and you get flooded. Things are constantly being negotiated in very smart uh, and meaningful and, and ways that make sense. <clears throat> um, food, you know, some, there are notions of, of uh, traditional food ways that didn't accommodate, if you get stuck in history, they don't accommodate for Cajun egg rolls, <laughs> crawfish tamales, microwave roux, and some of the thing, other things that strain the imagination. <coughs> <laughs> All the while, we also enjoy hamburgers and fried chicken with iced tea and Dr. Pepper without feeling that we are betraying our Cajunness. So <coughs> I was going to give you uh, a few examples of uh, in the world of Cajun music, but let me just uh, do one. Basically, it has to do with how do you get? How did we get from performing here, back in the 30s, to performing here today? There's a remarkable difference between the music that was played here and the music that's played here. For one thing, there was no electricity. For another thing, it was essentially for dancers. It was in a dance hall, closed off. Courting is going on. People are paying attention to the music only to dance to. Here, as Dewey pointed out, <clears throat> what's happening? Well, people are listening, people are watching, people are gathered in a remarkably different way. And so musicians will obviously uh, renegotiate what they're playing. This is an example of what Ralph Rensler recorded the Balfour Brothers playing in 1964. <coughs> song called Parlez Nous Avoir. So what happens if you're, if you're young, a member of Fufole, and you're playing in front of a crowd that looks more like that festival crowd? What will you come up with? Well, this is what Chris Stafford and uh, Fufole came up with. <coughs> Now, you know, that probably upsets the sensibilities of some people who think of Cajun music as historically traditional. But I'm here to tell you, from my observations in Louisiana, if you don't do that, then it's stuck in a preservation hall. It's dead. You may not always like it. Dewey Balfa famously said of these kinds of, he said, I don't like what they're doing, but I sure am glad they're doing it which I thought was an absolutely brilliant <laughs> observation. <clears throat> Some of the stuff that people do are designed to produce a rouse from the crowd. You can hear it. In the opening of that version of the Bosco Stomp, he's letting the crowd have a chance to cheer and get into it. <clears throat> uh, people started doing all sorts of uh, 
in reimagined songs, uh, style was shifting within his traditional re repertoire. People like uh, Steve Riley and the Mama Playboys uh, would do things like uh, four part harmonies on old classics. And something about it works. Uh, <clears throat> rearranged song openings for crowd effect, uh, ch uh, stringing together two or uh, two or more traditional tunes to m produce medleys, um, rearranged songs for obvious dramatic effect. These strategies have, ha strategies have influenced subsequent generations, as is evident in the arrangements of many contemporary Cajun groups. <coughs> Eventually. Uh, Fiddler David Greeley learned to play a swamp pop saxophone to accompany according to Steve Riley's forays into Zydeco and swamp pop. People, things were changing ev even faster than some festival organizers were expecting. When Steve Riley, who was sort of our, you know, hope for the future, stuck in the past kind of guy, imitating the past. Uh, Heir to Dewey Balfa, except actually he ended up being heir to Dewey because he continued to think about it as Dewey did. When he pulled in 19, 1994, he pulled a big red chromatic accordion out of the bag on stage at our festival. The South Louisiana crowd experienced a moment not unlike the one experienced by the Newport Folk Festival in 65 when Dylan plugged in to play Maggie's Farm. But as Bruce Jackson has pointed out, that crowd at 65 in Newport was not mad at Dylan. They were mad at Peter Yarrow for trying to get him off. They were actually loving it. When festival of, uh, uh, producers heard the new licks, there was some consternation and concern that the traditional Cajun music's fair-haired band was sliding toward the progressive side. What was undeniable was that the crowd loved it. A remarkable exchange of emails I had with Greeley and band manager and bassist uh, Peter Schwartz de demonstrated that band men members were keenly aware of these issues, as well as the eff effects of changing context, audience expectations at home and on the road, and the tensions between artistic and cultural integrity. So <clears throat> what happens? Well, it continues, and people continue to experiment, producing new songs, some of them that take on um, the audience. Issues of uh, cultural as a, a natural and linguistic erosion. <clears throat> Listen to the first words. This is uh, Steve Riley and the Mama Playboy's typical opening song at outdoor concerts. <clears throat> it's called Danser Sans Comprendre, Dancing Without Understanding. Why am I sing? Pourquoi je suis après chanter? Comment ça se fait je suis après chanter, bébé, in a language you don't understand? Why am I singing in a language you don't understand? And he goes on to say, you know, c'est pas assez, danser sans comprendre. It's not enough to dance without understanding. You've got to fully engage. I mean, they were taking on the crowd, saying, you know, yeah, that's fine. Y'all are dancing and pretending to love this stuff, but it takes more. You've got to engage more. And there were other things that, you know, toyed with what was going on. <laughs> wow. 
why not? <laughs> Some, including uh, poet Kirby Jean Bois and singer Rocky McKeon, have even explored possibilities including Cajun hip hop and neo metal. Others, like Anne Savoy, Jane Vadreen, Megan Brown, Kelly Jones Savoy, have elected to explore in other directions. Uh, That's an old song from, oops, there I am again. <coughs> That's an old song from uh, the Lomax Collection and, and uh, obviously recycled and rethought and regenerated. Uh, they all continue to produce music that is playful and thoughtful and challenging as we expect young music to be. At the same time, it's re as respectful and grounded as I hope it would be. Young Cajun music is a perfect example of what Dewey Bafa meant when he said he wanted to preserve not the music itself, but the process that produces the music, so that musicians will continue to innovate and improvise new forms that both surprise us and reassure us at the same time. And this brings us back to Henry Glassie. This is an obviously ongoing process, undoubtedly influenced by the past, but not trapped in it, in the spirit of Glassie's definition of tradition as, quote, the creation of the future out of the past. <clears throat> Dewey Balfa also said, a culture is preserved one generation at a time. Cajun and Creole cultures have endured in their own terms into the present generation. What happens in the next will continue to decide their futures. They have remarkable filtering systems. Once again, it is critically important to consider the context, especially those who consume all this cultural activity. How long will young Cajun and Creole bands play what they play without some sort of crowd to play for? Turn, turning the fieldwork gaze toward the crowds expo exposes a simple truth. What works doggedly endures, and what doesn't work fades mercifully away. Yet Dewey, who learned about cultural activism from the intellectual descendants of Alan Lomax and Charles Seeger, realized that we should not leave such things entirely to the laws of natural selection, and urged that we water the roots so that the tree might have a chance to live. Despite the admittedly activist perspective that we share, we both know you can't force the passage of tradition on anyone. What I have tried to do is to observe it, understand it as well as I can, and present the results of that understanding in as many ways as I can, uh, <coughs> I can think of, including academic reporting, media presentation, public presentation. In that public presentation, I have tried to make it attractive and available, and then step back watch what happens, and then try to understand that. And folklore and fieldwork continue to be the best ways to understand this process that evolves at the speed of life. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry that was a little long, but uh, we have maybe a little time of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering, looking at those images of the, the traditional dance and then the, the festival crowd, what occurred to me is the fusion of the two in the form of the mosh pit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, musicians who are aware of this uh, have challenged the fourth wall. Uh, I remember back in 1980 something, uh, Rockin' Doopsy had a 50 foot chord. We were always wondering, why does he have a 50 foot chord? And in the first song, he stepped back and took off and jumped into the crowd and played. It's like, and this was like before mosh pits, right? <clears throat> so uh, I think the, the 
the to me the the most important thing to take one of the most important things to take out of out of all of this is that um, it's a mistake to confuse history and tradition. You know, history is what happened in the past, and tradition is what came from it, but is still going on, and it's still happening, and it's and it's it's producing what we're experiencing today. And in that regard, it has it has a quality of the present and even the future. And and sometimes it surprises us in ways that we kind of wish we weren't surprised, <laughs> but too bad, you know. It, we're not cultural policemen, and we shouldn't be. Yes? Can you uh, distinguish, or should we distinguish, uh, between black folk and indigenous people? Well, in the words of Mark Savoy, a sage uh, and musician from South Louisiana, one begins with a C and the other begins with a Z. <laughs> <clears throat> there are some tendencies, and you know, you could probably tease them out toward the edges, but there's so much common ground in the middle that I don't know why. I'm not sure it's all that useful. Zydeco is proudly uh, the product of um, the Creole community, the African Creole community of Louisiana, and Cajun music is the product of the French Acadian community. But they owe so much to each other, and they've they've, interla they've uh, interlaced in so many ways and influenced each other in so many ways that, uh, and that is what's wonderful about it. It'd be kind of like. It'd be kind of like trying to analyze a gumbo. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's flour and oil and onions and chicken and garlic, but it's better just to eat the gumbo. <laughs> of what? Hippitayo. <laughs> uh, for a long time. People, uh, th well, there are a lot of words like this, like Zydeco itself, right? People thought black was trendy from Zydeco. Except the problem is that the way it's used, on va Zydeco to la vie, what, you get a string bean on that? No. <laughs> so it's not a noun, it's a verb. And you know, without going into a long explanation, uh, if you look to France, the other place that that came from, well, Thacker. If you look there, that term seems to be closely associated to dancing and courtship rituals. And music it makes a lot more sense. Hippotayo. <coughs> a lot of people thought it was tied from the, the term tayo, which is the Cajun French word for a hound dog. They thought it was about two thieves and a hound dog. They stole my sled. Except that doesn't make a lot of sense either. Well, how would dogs be stealing a sled? And why would they? Well, it turns out that hippotayo, if you take the whole thing and don't, don't carve out the tayo part, hippotayo is what Cajuns heard cowboys from Texas yelling when they were herding cattle. As in hippotayo, tayo, galloping on. That makes a lot more sense if those bums from Texas were stealing our sled <laughs> than it is dogs. But sometimes when you point out these things that you're discovering through you know, linguistic analysis, it makes some people nervous. No, no, I want my beans, I want my dog. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes knowledge is inconvenient. <laughs> okay, more questions? Yeah, yeah, sure, as many as you like. Yes. I have had a blast. I
a lot of it from what Gary used to get on, you know, on the 90s uh, and Gary did buy a soap box inside when I went down in my place like they're all closed. Yeah. Do you know why? <coughs> well, change of context. There are different places to play. Uh, that the erosion of the traditional um, historical dance hall um, began when restaurants started programming their music along the street, through the music, and started making spaces in their restaurants. Uh, and more <coughs> restaurants were regularly hiring big musical bands, so the dance hall started to break through too. You got, you know, nobody, there aren't any house dancers in the, in the area. So I started getting a guy in the city, uh, you know, out of California, who was a club music. Came with the ball and then stayed away from the uh, no longer uh, perceived as house dancers. Now there are a lot of venues within the apartment city that you know there are some there are some venues, but the first thing you've got to do to break through is they don't look like historical dance halls anymore. Mm -hmm. But the historical dance halls didn't look like house dance halls. So you know, yeah, yeah. The one thing. Sometimes that stuff is surprising, which is good. I also say that when the process that I was just describing is really in stride, you know, and, and hitting on all eight cylinders, working well, it produces things that both surprise us and reassure us in the same way. Wow, I didn't see that coming, but oh, I see what it came from. figure it out. Um, and uh, other than that, being a violin, so violin is everywhere. Uh, guitar, that's part of everywhere. And Fender's that Raptor, I mean, everything. I mean, every, everything's fair game. Everything's fair game. Steel guitar, where'd you go to get a steel guitar? I said, steel guitar. And, and, and steel guitar maker somewhere. The shit started. I mean, and by the way, we, we just did last year, just this past year, um, we revisited something that we had done in the mid 80s. traditional music instruments made in Western Europe. And you'd be surprised what you can make. So we make an electric guitar, a steel guitar, 